You know, much is made of the idea of freedom. That is a tenet that's almost held to a sacred level in our culture, in America especially, but really I think all people have this desire for freedom. It goes all the way back to the garden. It's considered one of the great founding tenets of our country, but I think somewhere along the way we forgot to ask the question of what exactly does it mean to be free? I, have, I got a meme that I asked Sherry to show that I think exemplifies some of the ways that we perceive freedom. Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you over the sound of my freedom. Now, that made me laugh, but also I think it expressed a truth about freedom in our culture, that we've forgotten really what it means to be free. We haven't really asked ourselves that question seriously. And What this meme expresses is that often I think we think freedom is for ourselves, that I'm so free that you can't tell me I'm not free and I can't even hear what you're saying. All right, you can remove the distracting eagle. Because surely when we say that we're free, it doesn't mean that I can take any woman I see that I desire for my wife or that I could rob a store just because I like the clothing they have there. Or surely when we say we're free, we don't mean that you can burn down our church building or steal from your neighbor. So if we're free, what does that really mean? Our culture doesn't have a clear answer on this question, and no earthly culture really ever has. That's why the freedom of one person has in our day and age become the tyranny of another. That my right to do and say what I please and think is true supersedes your right to do and say and what you please and think is true. This conflict in our culture has spilled over into the church. What exactly is Christian freedom, I don't think, is a question we ask ourselves often enough. The Bible says in John chapter 8, the slave does not remain in the house forever, the son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And we all gathered here believe that this is exactly what the Son of God did on the cross. He set you free. He set me free. But usually, I think, if we're being honest, and I include myself in this, I hear that and I think hip, hip, hooray, and then I don't really think too much about what exactly it means that I've been set free by Jesus. What exactly have I been set free from, and what have I been set free for? Does that mean I can now do whatever I want to whomever I want whenever I want to do it? That sounds like freedom to some people. But I think our sanctified consciences tell us the answer to that question is obviously no. We know that Jesus didn't come to save us by dying on the cross and rising from the dead so that we can all behave as our own little gods in our own little universes and do whatever we want. In fact, many Christian scholars, including Martin Luther, argued that the freedom of that sort is just an illusion. For human beings, the freedom of that sort doesn't exist. But often when someone says that they have free will, that's what they mean, that they're like God and they can do whatever they want. See, these Christian scholars argue that human beings, by our created nature, cannot have freedom like that. Does this statement grate on your American sensibilities? I know it does on mine, but it's really not just an American thing. People in all times and places, all the way back to the Garden of Eden, have wished that they could be something more than the created being that they are. Hear are these words, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's a Bible quote, but who said that? The devil. When he tempted Eve to disobey God for the first time, but certainly not the last, and what avenue of temptation did he use? You'll be like your own God free in a way that it turns out 
through a long history of suffering and pain, we are unequipped to be. Actually, the end result of that was the opposite of freedom. We became slaves, slaves to sin, slaves for our own hearts and our own sinful flesh, the opposite of freedom. And the depth of our sin is such that even when it comes to our Christian freedom, it's woefully easy for the devil and our own flesh to enslave us again by making us think that real freedom is being our own little God in our own little universe. Quite a clever tactic, I would think. How easy would it be to keep someone enslaved if you convince them that the very thing that enslaves them is their freedom? Well, in our epistle reading today, Paul is talking about Christian freedom. He's trying to help us make sense of what we do as Christians when we find out that because of what Christ has done, we have been set free. And he does this by describing in a real situation, in a real congregation of new Christians, what exactly this looks like to live in freedom. So Paul begins our epistle today in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 8 with this maxim that I think will be helpful in guiding us as we go through the text. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. You see, he's writing this because, and you can even see in the text that some of these things are in quotations, known sayings to the people he's writing to, all of us possess knowledge, this knowledge, right? Um, And later on, for we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. Things that clearly Paul is writing to people who are saying these very things. And he's writing to them because the knowledgeable and sophisticated members of the Christian church in Corinth took a broad view of their entitlement to eat meat sacrifice to idols. Now, why is that? Well, they had learned in their catechesis some new knowledge that there's only one God, that idols, in fact, aren't real, nor are the deities that are supposedly inhabiting them or behind them or represented in them, and therefore, they're not real. And that's why in verse 4, Paul writes to them, we know that an idol has no real existence or that there is no God but one. He's not quoting those as a way of mocking their truth, but a true catechesis has occurred. Wouldn't you agree? There, There is no God but one. Idols aren't real. And the Bible expresses this truth, often sometimes harshly in the Old Testament. In Isaiah, there's a stretch of verses where he sort of makes fun of the idea that man makes God out of the same wood and stone that he uses to make all kinds of other things. So if the gods of idols weren't real, then sacrificial meat was really just meat. There was, however, two problems with what they did with this new knowledge. One was what Paul says in verse 7. They forgot that, however, not all possess this knowledge. Not everybody knows what you've been told and taught in church. A wise thing to remember, not just for this, but many other things. And the second problem was that the possession of superior religious knowledge does not guarantee that those who learn those things will apply that knowledge in the proper spirit of their new life in Christ. Knowledge puffs up, remember? Gathering knowledge greater than those around us naturally tends to puff us up and make us feel more important and leads to boasting in self rather than God after all. I have all the answers. Come to me. Oh, wait a minute. You're not supposed to come to me. You're supposed to come to Jesus. So what does Paul instruct them to do? He instructs them to love. Love the weaker brother. After all, Christ loves the weaker brother, so much so that He died for them. 
He points out that eating meat sacrificed to idols, really eating any food, does not commend you to God in any way. But if you eat meat sacrificed to idols, and this causes the destruction of faith for your brother who's weaker in the faith, you have sinned against Christ and against your brother. Therefore, for the sake of Christ and my brother, I will not eat meat sacrificed to idols. And Paul states this emphatically by not even just specifying that, but he says, I'll stop eating meat altogether for the sake of my brother who is weak in the faith. Such is the extent of Christian freedom and love in this instance. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound much like the freedom our world talks about, the freedom to submit yourself to the conscience of a weaker person. That sounds like a constraint, actually, not a freedom. But here's where Paul moves us back to understanding where this comes from and the real source of Christian freedom. See, for Paul, the freedom that comes from the revelation of knowledge about God is to be used in love for serving the weak rather than one's own desires. So rather than saying, I'm sorry I can't hear you over the sound of my own freedom, freedom is actually meant to be in service to the building up of those who are weaker in faith. Now, maybe it's hard for us to think of this in terms of meat sacrificed to idols. After all, I don't know about you, but in the last 34 years, I've never eaten meat sacrificed to idols. But Paul's really addressing a contemporary issue of the congregation that he's writing to. So let's think of some of those things in our day and age. Now, you may have heard in Bible class me use the term adiaphora, which is a Greek word that's used to refer to things that are not expressly forbidden in the Scriptures nor are they explicitly commanded. That frustrating gray area where the Bible doesn't tell you things like you shouldn't be on your iPhone more than two hours a day. Well, when we get into the realm of Christian freedom, often this is what it's discussing. Things that now that we live under grace, we have all kinds of options, but how are we supposed to behave and choose? What's the spirit and the attitude that we are to utilize this new freedom with? So here's a few contemporary examples. The kinds of clothes you come to wear when you come to church. There's no biblical command given that this has to be a three-piece suit, nor that it has to be casual. We have Christian freedom to choose, but keeping Paul's principle of love versus knowledge in mind, it should be chosen precisely for the reason so as not to offend or cause a stumbling block for the conscience of the weaker brother. And I should mention, we're saying brother here a lot. Brother in this instance means both brother and sister. So these rules apply to everybody. Or what about the style of music that's played in church or the instrument that it's played on? The Bible doesn't give express command or forbid rules on those things. But they should be utilized, again, keeping the maxim of Paul in mind, that precisely because they're of the nature that God hasn't explicitly commanded them, they should never come in between someone's faith. Or what about the time of church on Sunday? Oh man, I've heard so many stories of having to move a service 30 minutes up or 30 minutes back and the whole place about destroys itself. That's how they offer Think about how some of those stories you've heard might have played out differently were the people in mind, or were the people keeping in mind the teaching of Paul here in 1 Corinthians 8. Rather than fighting about what they want, they should be tripping over themselves advocating for what the other person needs. So the knowledge of my freedom in Christ is not meant to be used for my own selfish desires, but rather for my weaker brother in the faith. Meaning, I cannot insist on my own freedom when it causes trouble for the conscience of another. Remember, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. In other words, Christians are set free to serve in love. That's what Christian freedom is, service in love. 
a sentence that certainly causes our world to scratch its head in confusion. And if we're being honest, some of us who are in the Christian church as well, you mean that I am going to be subject to the conscience of a weaker person? Yes, you are. But it really isn't the sort of subjugation that you dread because it's rooted in one who demonstrated this to you to the end result being the salvation of your soul. Being set free to serve is the actual reflection of our created creaturely relationship with God. We were never intended to be, nor as it turns out, capable of being our own little gods. We were always meant to be human beings who love and obey God, and He sets the rules. He sets the tone. So how do we know what the tone is that He sets? How do we know the rules? Well, the same way Paul does and what he references here in our epistle reading, we look at Jesus. Paul writes in verse 11, and so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. How does Jesus feel about those weaker in the faith? He loves them so much so that He dies for them. Jesus loves the weaker brother. You know, the one who frustrates you because he or she gets in the way of the exercise of your freedom as a Christian. He loves them so much, He died for them. Now, the last part of our meditation this morning brings home the reality that often when we think of these things, let's be honest, we never think of the weaker brother as being me. It's usually, oh, I remember this time that somebody in church, they were the weaker brother, and maybe you're remembering it thinking, oh, I have to repent of what I did because I didn't take their conscience into account. But it's a little bit easier when the weaker brother is always somebody else, isn't it? The truth is, we've all been the weaker brother, and we will be again. We are all alike. We all like to take our knowledge and primarily use it to serve ourselves. Anytime you insist on the way the, to do things the way that you personally like them, despite having no scriptural support or any authority, as our gospel states, to say so, you have been the weaker brother. So how do we prevent this weakness from becoming a tyranny over our community, over our brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, notice that Paul doesn't say that the knowledge here is bad, but the application of the knowledge for selfish gain is bad, without regard for the well-being of the brother or sister in Christ. So how do we turn knowledge as then a servant to love, right? Because knowledge by itself puffs up, but love builds up. Well, we share the knowledge, and all the while, as long as is needed, we submit ourselves to what is needed for the conscience of the weaker brother, but we also teach them the same things that we have learned. After all, this is what Paul is doing to the church in Corinth by writing this very letter. He says in multiple places in the New Testament, I am only giving you that which I have received from Jesus. And so, that's why we do things like small group studies and Bible classes to learn things, to learn what God would have us revealed knowledge about Himself so that we can experience the freedom He so greatly desires to give us, a freedom born out of Christian love, where knowledge is used in service to love to build up the weaker brother rather than in service to myself at the risk of harming others. Now, as good a news as that is, that you can now do those things with the knowledge that you have, there's even better news for you this morning and what Paul says. And this is good news that we have the best, stronger brother there is. It's true that we've all been the weaker brother at times, and we will be again. And there'll be times where you look back and realize, I did exactly the opposite of what Paul is saying here. And you'll need to repent of that and probably apologize to someone. But the good news is that we have a brother in faith stronger than us who never does that. He never looks at our weakness of faith and casts us off. And He gave up the actual freedom that we supposedly tried to get in the Garden of Eden, more freedom than we can imagine because He is the actual God of the actual universe, not a pretend little God of a pretend universe. He gave all of that up 
for you. Let that sink in for a moment. For that is the price for your newfound freedom, a freedom of love, a love to serve, serve those who also need to hear of this great news that God loves them so much. I was listening to a podcast as I was preparing for the sermon, and one of the things mentioned in there was they were talking about what was the source of joy and love for early Christians in these congregations in the early church. And they were sort of joking at that sometimes we think that it's, they now have the opportunity to be like Jesus. That's not what made them joyful. What made them joyful was that they learned about Jesus and what He did for them. That He gave up all the freedom and power that comes with being God, subjected Himself to the conscience of those weaker than Him, took upon their sin, died in their place, and rose victorious from the dead. Why? For you. Indeed, love builds up. And it turns out that love builds up all the way to eternal life. In the name of Jesus, amen.